Developers often include unexpected things in their games. So let's talk about some of the wilder ones. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on Game Rank 7, crazy things developers hid inside their video games. Starting off at number seven, the developer for the game, A Dark Room, Amir Rajan, revealed he left a secret code editor in his game. All you have to do to bring up the code editor is plug a USB keyboard into the Switch, and according to Rajan, effectively turns every consumer Nintendo Switch into a Ruby machine. He said, I got into coding because I wanted to make games. Doing that back in the 90s was difficult. Nintendo's response to learning this information was removing the game from the Nintendo eShop immediately, and the publisher, Circle, very quickly apologized for any problems this may have caused. After this became an actual thing that people concentrated on, the developer noted that he kind of hobbled the editor, so it wouldn't really do a lot if one accessed it. For instance, using the code editor, you couldn't actually even render an image if you wanted to, and said he believes that the game and the editor itself would not have been removed from the eShop if he had presented it as it actually was, a sort of limited code editor with the intention of allowing you to work on the game as a sandbox. So was it a publicity stunt gone bad? I don't know, but he definitely could have handled it differently and it probably wouldn't have backfired in his face so badly. However, it's just really cool that he did that, to be completely honest. The idea that you could actually work on the game using an editor that the game provided is kinda neat. If you could have modded his game using the editor he included, that wouldn't be bad. It actually would be kinda cool. Moving on to number six, the ESEA League Esports League had to admit that they put a Bitcoin miner in their client. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Bitcoin, it's a virtual currency that's mined with GPUs, and you might see why that's a problem now, using the GPUs of people subscribed to the league, which by the way, are a machine that can eventually wear out, and guess what, several peoples did. Several hundred people made claims with the company that the software damaged their GPUs, which if you've ever mined Bitcoin is not uncommon as a Bitcoin miner will often run these at higher temperatures, wearing them out much faster than just doing what was intended with them, gaming. And the company actually resolved it with these people presumably replacing their graphics cards. It wasn't the league itself that decided to do this, but an employee who managed to just insert the code into an update for the client and it mined about $3,800 and gave it to him. I can't imagine that guy didn't get in trouble for that. That sounds like a massive breach of like employee contracts. And I'm sure that a lot of the headlines involving this really ended up looking like it was intentional that the company included the miner. And it really wasn't with some rogue employee who wanted to make some money for himself. And at number five, the version of Resident Evil 2 that eventually hit the market was not the original Resident Evil 2 intended. There's actually a game that was 70% complete that was showed off as Resident Evil 2 for quite a while and was abandoned, confusing people who bought Resident Evil 2. Now this was a really long time ago and a lot of that game has been forgotten, although the game itself has not. It's lived on as a sort of Resident Evil folklore this game is commonly referred to in the Resident Evil community as Resident Evil 1.5, and there is a nod that was included in Resident Evil 2's remake to this game, where it has literally never been referenced in any canon game for Resident Evil, and it's actually pretty cool. The digital deluxe version of Resident Evil 2 Remake includes a costume of Eliza Walker for Claire Redfield. Eliza is from Resident Evil 1.5. Now this one is maybe a little bit less shocking than embedding a Bitcoin miner, but to acknowledge this game that literally exists nowhere in the canon of Resident Evil, in perhaps one of the most well-received and large-scale Resident Evil games in the last decade, it's actually really cool. Hideki Kamiya and Noboru Sugimura, the director and writer respectively, have spoken about this game a few times, and it's actually got a really varied history that's worth looking into. Moving on to number four, the game Watch Dogs was controversial because it was regarded as a massive downgrade from the game that was originally announced 
several years prior to its release, which, by the way, had a tech demo that looked absolutely beautiful. What people referred to as the downgrade was fairly broad in that even the mechanics kind of didn't live up to the original announcement's intent. However, it was the graphics that were really particularly scrutinized, as, like I said, the original announcement video showed off some pretty amazing graphics. Those graphics were actually included in the final game. However, the settings in order to enable them were all disabled and you had to edit the game on your own. Now, the actual Watch Dogs team basically kind of disavows it, saying it makes the performance of the game bad and that's the whole reason they didn't include them. And perhaps at the time, back in 2014 when this was found, sure, I'm sure computers probably couldn't handle it that great, but that's not true now. If you go ahead and enable these things now, the game just looks way better. I mean, it doesn't change the fact that it didn't entirely deliver gameplay-wise, but for the sake of argument, the sequel at least did, and if you want to go back to the first and see it in a nicer way, there's plenty of documentation on the internet as to how to do so. And at number three, hey, would you believe that something is amiss in Metal Gear Survive? And no, I'm not talking about the game itself. I could be. It's... <sighs> I mean, it's Metal Gear Survive, you know what that means, right? Someone went ahead and did something fun. Somebody who is presumably a Hideo Kojima sympathizer that remained at Konami, probably for reasons of, you know, a paycheck. And at the very beginning of the game, you enter your name, which is added to a clipboard of names. And the first letter of all of the names going downward spell KGP Forever, which KGP is, of course, Kojima Productions. Obviously, this is a message to Konami from the developers of the Konami game. We like Hideo Kojima better. Now, I can't tell you how that got into the game, but I have to imagine after it was made public, Konami probably wasn't stoked about it. So, I guess, thinking about it, maybe somebody got in trouble, but maybe it was kind of worth it. Keeping in mind, of course, that Kojima Productions has hired numbers of people from Konami in the ensuing years. Moving on to number two, 2016 Doom is a pretty awesome game with some very awesome music in it. And at 2017 GDC, the sound director went ahead and named something that the public hadn't caught on to at the time. He included a voiceover that was reversed. It sounded quite spooky and reminiscent of old satanic messages embedded into music intended to provoke some sort of outrage. Mick Gordon, the game's composer, couldn't resist including an homage to that, given Doom's position relative to METAL. However, he didn't include any sort of satanic message or anything even controversial. In fact, he just had a voice whisper, JESUS LOVES YOU, and reversed it. And it actually sounds pretty scary. However, once you reverse it and listen to it, you're like, oh, I guess, eh. Not exactly a message that strikes fear into anybody's heart. But when he played the clip for the audience at the GDC, they just erupted in laughter because, as you know, secret messages are often not benign. Again, like I said, they're often intended to provoke some sort of outrage. Here, it clearly did not. And finally, at number one, the ZX Spectrum, a fairly old computer, had an emulator included on GoldenEye, the Nintendo 64 game. The reason for that is that Rare used to develop games for the ZX Spectrum, and were intending to see if they could emulate the ZX Spectrum on the Nintendo 64, and as they developed it, they used the GoldenEye 64 developer kit that they were working on in order to test it. And the code was disabled when the game was released, but using an emulator on the PC, you can actually patch GoldenEye to play the emulation of another system on the emulator that you're using on the PC to play Nintendo 64, which is the most confusing sounding thing of all time, but it's really just using an emulator to patch a game to play an emulator, which just to be 100% clear, is a very roundabout way of playing the ZX Spectrum, and I'm not 100% sure why you wouldn't just download an emulator for it if that was something you were particularly interested in doing. And finally, how about a little bonus for you, the whole hot coffee Grand Theft Auto thing. We've talked about it a lot. You can find it in a lot of our videos, but it's definitely worth including as a bonus here because modders used code that was in the game itself in order to play a sex mini game that got left in the game. Again, if you want to know more about it, we've done a lot of videos that have talked about it. It's kind of hilarious and weirdly like important as far as history goes of mods. And that's all for today. 
Have you ever uncovered a weird Easter egg or possibly something unintentional? Either on this list or in another game? Leave us a comment, tell us what you think, and if you like this video, please click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe and the notification bell. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon, you can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.